So, uh, on today's agenda, basically uh, what we're going to discuss is business continuity and disaster recovery, also known as BCDR. So if we keep saying BCDR, it's just quicker. Um, so we're going to discuss BCDR considerations, stuff like uh, recovery point objective, recovery time objective. If you don't know what that means, it's not a big deal. We're going to go over that in a minute. Um, we're going to talk about helper technologies um, that help us with uh, BCDR impact. So, for instance, voice services, voice over IP, virtualization, data connectivity, cloud computing, and then we're going to end up with a Q&A session. All right, so what keeps CFOs up at night? All right, it's a dramatic uh, title, but you know, you'd think uh, what keeps CFOs up at night should be something to, relative to, to finance or other things. We're going to talk about technology today. So the reason technology, obviously, has become such an uh, important topic for CFOs is because technology is directly associated with productivity, right? And if technology comes to a halt, productivity comes to a halt, which means revenue, no revenue, a lot of other things, company, uh, corporate image, a lot of things, right? So you can only uh, sustain a business for so long when it's not running. Um, so, and then you also have the, uh, the challenge of not overspending on IT, right? You, gotta, you have to kind of walk a fine line because you want to make sure you're insuring yourselves, but you don't want to over-insure. And you also, you, you know, you hear all these buzzwords nowadays, cloud computing, virtualization, uh, voice over IP, but what actually is an effective technology that you guys should be using as opposed to just uh, something that you heard out there about the cloud, should you be using the cloud, can you leverage these technologies? And actually you can, and there's a, there's a, there's a balance, and, there's a, and we're gonna go over, over that balance uh, now. Uh, I Think about where I'm standing. So today we're going to talk about uh, business continuity and disaster recovery basics. Uh, you can talk for hours on business continuity plans. I'm sure you guys have attended seminars where they, they just go into that for, for an hour and a half. But we're just going to talk, Sean, about some of the basic things with uh, business continuity and disaster recovery planning. So when you're doing a plan, you find that a lot of people just think about their information technology, their servers, their data center, and they don't really consider every aspect of a, of a good business continuity and disaster recovery plan. Um, when you're planning it, you really need to think about your, tele your telephony, your voice, your facilities, your employees. I think during this last hurricane, we found issues where your employees were out of contact for weeks on end. I mean, no cell phones, no home phones. So the best laid plans, I think, during Hurricane Sandy were, were destroyed. Uh, even if you had tech systems, I mean, you were really challenged to keep things going in any way, shape, or form. Um, and of course, during that time, you're communicating with your customers. Do your customers have better plans or worse plans? Uh, you're back up, but none of your customers are. So what, what good was that? Uh, or, or vice versa. And your customers then notice that you're having issues. So uh, when you want to talk about business continuity planning, you need to consider different aspects of the plan, not just the computers. We're missing our little, uh, <laughs> little duty. Um, so when you're talking about recovery and uh, business continuity, what you want to talk about two things in the industry we talk about is RPO and RTO. Uh, recovery point objective and recovery time objective. So recovery point objective is, so if you have an event, uh, <coughs> a hurricane, a, an outage, a fire, any kind of disaster, recovery point objective is going back in time. So it's to say, you know, we have an issue and we're going to be rendering data for the last hour. When we come back up, we're going to be an hour behind or 24 hours behind or 48 hours behind. Recovery time objective moves into the future and it says, well, if we had an event, are we back up operating within one hour, two hours, 24 hours, or in some cases, two weeks? Um, pretty much the closest, <laughs> the closer you are to the event in both sides, the more expensive it gets. So if things skip a beat and you're back up in 30 seconds, um, both in the future and 30 seconds back, that was expensive. Uh, if you can wait you know, a few days on either side or hours on either side, obviously things get cheaper. Um, and, and what should drive that is the, the pieces of the business that need to be up and running. I think a lot of times people swing for the fences and they say, you know, we have an operating company, we need everything up and running in an hour, and we need everything back uh, the way it was five minutes ago. But the reality is that's not really true when you start to go down the line. And what you really need to do is make a list of every piece that your business uses, whether it's a line of business application, email, voice, uh, facilities, and from there you figure out whether you need to have a critical or an urgent issue where you need to get it back up and running in an hour or five minutes or something that could wait a couple days. So um, I think during Hurricane Sandy, we, we saw issues where you know, people wanted to have their communications up and running, say, in a, you know, an hour. But if they had facilities and they were making deliveries and none of their clients could accept those deliveries, then why, why have your whole operation back up and running with trucks driving on the streets when no one's getting deliveries? So 
you need to actually think through every piece of, the, um, of your business. Um, all right. Once you have the plan in place, I don't care. How many people actually have a written business continuity plan for their business? <laughs> all right, so that makes some of the next questions a little moot. <laughs> um, no, we find this too, and it, it's interesting. I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's an expensive and often confusing uh, exercise. People don't, it seems a little overwhelming in some ways because there's so many things to consider. But, you know, I, I think you should start with, even, even the, 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 just start with something and, and start writing it up. Uh, you want to do little exercises. So once you have something in place, what you want to do is do what's called tabletop exercises, which could be a few executives sitting around a table just running through a scenario uh, verbally. You know, we have an outage here, we're at this uh, critical facility, what do we do? And then of course you can have medium exercises or complex exercises where uh, if you have, let's say you have something in place where every employee can work from home. It may be a good idea to pull the trigger on that twice a year and have everybody work from home and see if that was, that was easy. It's better to have an issue, it's better to identify issues with your plan when things are working uh, versus when you have a situation and you need to, you, you know, there's no fix, right? And of course you want to test and verify that that, that recovery is in place. And then once you have that in place, you want to maintain that plan. Um, vendors change, employees change, key employees change, facilities change, software changes. So you're going to want to make sure that you, you're, you're looking at, you know, what has changed and rewrite that plan or adjust it accordingly. And you're going to want to make sure your, your staff, your clients, and your vendors are on board with that. So a uh, business continuity plan may have multiple people involved. It may not just be your employees. It may be uh, an IT vendor, a phone vendor, a facilities vendor. And you want to make sure that they're involved in that in those, those exercises. So, you know, before we get to Boyd, right, sure. from Stony Book's perspective, right, uh, you can call up the one slide. Uh, sure. Yeah. So we, we went through the Hurricane Sandy, and uh, we really did learn a lot from, from that experience. Uh, when you step back and look at what Stony Brook University is, we had 10,000 students ride that storm out on campus with us. We had a, a, a hospital that was fully operational during the entire storm. We had a veterans home that we needed to keep up and running. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, the reason I raised my hand when, when, uh, when the kind of about the I written asked plan. about the written plan, uh, you know, we, were, we did some planning when we saw this thing coming. Uh, we have our, our SOMAS uh, uh, school that monitors the weather, uh, warning us that this thing was coming in. So we were monitoring it there. Uh, but we have an emergency uh, management center that needs to be set up with the police uh, force that we have, security, IT, uh, food service. You know, I mean, you, you can imagine all the different disciplines that need to, 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 to come to the table. So Which slide did you want to You can just bring this up. So, so what we did is some lessons learned, and you heard some of it, right? Uh, we had to worry about keeping these students occupied during the storm, okay? Uh, so, yeah, we have, we have cable television, but these kids are on the internet, right? So uh, luckily, we generate our own electricity on campus. We went off the grid. We went off the light of grid. So, How many of you generate your own electricity? <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, in addition to generating our own electricity, critical buildings have backup generators, right? So that's all part of the plan. And I think as you think about what the implications are as you develop this plan, uh, your, your disaster plan, you know, what happens? And, and it's not, not just the, the network connectivity that we control, but once it goes off the campus, you know, we kept up and running. We, we had about a 17-minute outage that had nothing to do with the storm. It just oh. something went wrong in our in our cogen plant. Uh, but once we got off the campus, the island was destroyed, and all those data networks, as, as you know from the business you're in, we had triple t tertiary backups. With different, we had a line going up the North Shore. We had a line going up the railroad. We had a line going up the South Shore of Long Island. These were all of our connectivities, uh, but two of them came together in Lower Manhattan. Right. And one of them, we lost the we lost the uh, a connection in Hicksville, and we found out that the two vendors we were using were on the same pole. Yeah. So you know, these are the kind of things that when when you go back and you talk to your your uh, technology guys about. How do we get? How do we communicate with the outside world? That's those are the kind of things that we learned here. And now the questions are: Well, why don't we go up through Port Jeff and over the Sound, or Wading River, or wherever the, the, there's a line up there? 
what, what are our uh, what are our alternatives there? What is below ground versus up in the poles? So we're on an island. Let's face it. You're not mm -hmm. gonna. These are questions you wouldn't even have asked. <laughs> exactly. But we're on an island, so you're not gonna you're not gonna uh, get everything 100 percent. But what we found and the lessons we've learned is what we thought was an adequate uh, strategy really wasn't. And uh, we could have done things a little better. And since then, we've, we've rejiggered some of our, our communication lines. But that was, a, that was probably the biggest hit we took uh, when it came to. Uh, Not through your own planet. Through the planet through, it was through the other of carriers. So now we've been spending a lot of time with those carriers. Where is, where is your line? And, and uh, where, does it, where are there single points of failure where maybe two carriers are coming to the same hub in Manhattan? So you have to do your job and their job. You have to do, exactly. You have to do both that. And you have to ask those tough questions because they're not going to want to volunteer this information, especially if there are vulnerabilities involved. Right. right? They'll, they'll see holes in their own network, and you know, that's not going to look <coughs> kindly on, on the service they provide. So. so you touched on it before, but you know, some of the other things, uh, you know, Communication on every employee should really know if, if, if they wake up in the morning and they can't get to work, what, what are they supposed to do? All right? And a lot of people don't necessarily have those, uh, those plans. I mean, think about your own organizations. Uh, you know, everyone should know that are you critical? Are you essential? Everyone thinks they're essential, but the reality is not everyone needs to be in the office the next day, but certain people do. And those people should know who they are, and there should be a plan. And when you see an event developing, you should plan for that. And you, you know what? We had people that uh, we, we, we housed on, hand, on campus. Unfortunately, during the storm, we had some people rushing to come in uh, and you know, dodging trees. And, and uh, you know, luckily, no one was, was seriously hurt. Unfortunately, we had a couple of students go out and uh, get into a bad car accident. Um, but the, the roads were really bad, and, and we all know that. So. Uh, so really, it's, it's communication, and then also, not only within your own plans, you should have a list of who are my critical suppliers and vendors. And, and if, if, if we can't get to the office, and I need to worry about one of those critical suppliers or critical vendors, do I know how to get in touch with them? So updating those... What, what's their business continuity plan? What, what, what's their business continuity plan? You should ask for that, sometimes asking for that in writing is good too. It, 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 exa exactly. So, you know, setting up, you know, the other thing, by losing that connectivity, we were out for 24 hours uh, with, with, with our ability, we went up to, uh, we went up to uh, our backup site in Syracuse, and at least we were able to get our websites updated out of Syracuse and out to the people who did have internet connectivity so that we were able to communicate what was going on. So thinking about how you're going to operate in those situations is another uh, Another important thing. How did you find yourself in Syracuse? What was? What, what How did you make the connection up in Syracuse? Well, we—that was our backup site. Uh, you know, being part of the state university system, oh, okay. Stony Brook University. We try and leverage each other's sites, oh. and there's a big uh, there's, there's a big hub up there. Oh, uh, that it's actually a way? company called Nizernet, which you may have, I don't know if you've yeah, that already. But Nizernet actually uh, acts. Uh, they they have a big communication pipe between the SUNY. Uh, so their data center is a backup to you. And their data center is a backup to ours. Right. So, and again, you mentioned critical versus non-critical before. It's really doing that assessment of what is critical and, and making sure that that happens. But don't be afraid to say, this isn't critical. And I don't have to, you know what, I'm going to take my chances on that. Well, same with the people. He's not or she's not critical. She doesn't have to... Be in. I got to worry about these these people that are going to keep the lights on and keep my business going and keep my reputation uh, up, etc. And I think these uh, like a lot of the things that you're talking about, um, you know, vary significantly with the size of your organization or, or or the components of your organization that are important. So, you know, what Thomas is saying, you know, I mean, he has a huge he has a huge infrastructure and a lot of resources, but there might be some of you with a 20, 30, 40 person office that doesn't have that kind of resource. Um, for, for those companies, uh, you leveraging your vendors uh, to ensure that those vendors are able to do a lot more for you uh, in, in terms of your VCDR uh, requirements is kind of where you have to look. Because in terms of investing in so much VCDR um, uh, planning, your, your vendors might already have solutions and um, 
templated plans for you, and, and they can be a trusted partner like like this. So my question kind of for Tom, because what you were saying, but also for the panel, is as you were doing your exercise and you were determining who's critical and who's not, did you also come across like dependencies that maybe at the beginning people weren't aware of, like, you know, hey, I'm really directly pointed back to somebody else. If I don't get their product, I don't operate either. You know, like where they would, you, you know. where that comes up, I, and you mentioned it before, we test it, right? I think an important part of developing a plan is that, and, and it, it's a pain, it really is, to gather people when they're trying to work sell and, 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 and keep the business going, to take time out and focus in on this. But that's when you really see that, because you get people in, and you say, okay, we're going to shut them. We're going to shut this. We're going to assume that we have this catastrophe. Now what happens? And that's when some of those Somebody dependencies get a that you didn't think or, about. You know, suddenly now they're out because they didn't get a report that they depend on every day or, you know. It, it, exactly. Yeah. Some of these tabletop exercises, that will all come out, where a lot of that will come out. Right. You have the, you have the right, right the stakeholders involved in that conversation, you know, with, a, with various degrees of understanding of the organization. All of those things should come out, and then each one needs to be uh, realized as an important or or not. You see people at, at that tabletop exercise that you kind of realize this person's not critical. We just we realize that through through that uh, environment. If you don't have the budgets to have a, a business continuity person, it's well worth it to bring someone in to run an exercise for you uh, that do this for a living because they'll get you thinking about things that you don't think about. And, uh, sometimes you'll say, wow, this will never happen, but you know, all that stuff, it happened. It happened, and, and quite frankly, we had another, another test of it two weeks ago when we had that, that 30 inches of snow out in Suffolk County where we still had to, the kids were there, we had to feed them, roads we had to protect them, the roads were bad, and, uh, and, and you know what, people continue to get sick and come to the hospital, and so all the, it, it, it's, it was tested again. Uh, luckily, we didn't have any catastrophic uh, issues. But again, time well worth it, and something that uh, you know, CFOs and, and top finance people, I know they think about, but you know what, I wonder how often it gets, it gets to the top of the priority list. Um, when, there's not an issue. when there's not an issue. And, and people, yeah, so. But we had an issue, it's real, and you know what, nothing says it can't happen again next week, so you just need, you need to be prepared for it, so. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. I'll stand over where I will stand. Easier for me to look at the screen. So um, raise your hand just if you have some sort of VoIP technology in your, your network infrastructure today. So so a lot a lot of people are already moving in that direction and understand kind of understand what it is, but uh, as the simplest definition of uh, what is voice over internet protocol, it's taking uh, an analog audio signal converting it into a digital signal, and then transmitting that signal over the internet to another endpoint, whether it's an IP phone, a mobile device, to an IP PBX, or to, a, uh, to the PSTN, which is the public switch telephone network, which are all the, the POTS lines, or the, the telephone companies, so exit to Verizon, or exit to uh, AT&T, or whomever. So that's basically what, what VoIP is in a nutshell. It's a set of these technologies that allow that to happen. Um, there are several different types of service offerings um, that fit into the residential categories and the business categories. Um, on, the, on the low end, you'll have your cable MSOs, your, your cable operators that provide residential POT services like um, POT sign replacements for your home, um, and also for the small business who have you know, one, two, three, four, five lines um, that they just want to get changed over from the regular phone company's lines to um, and internet service providers lines. Basically those things are kind of uh, on par with one another in terms, of, in terms of feature sets. They do the same thing, relatively the same thing. Um, so that's on the, on the low end. Um, kind of moving towards uh, more of the, the medium-sized businesses or small and medium-sized businesses, you're looking at an on-premise PBX or an IP PBX, something like a Shortel phone system or a Cisco call manager or an Avaya IP office. Those are called IP PBXs. And they essentially are the same thing as a, as a, a standard PBX, but the transmission of voice from the call processing unit to the, the phones is IP instead of analog. One of the benefits, the, the VoIP benefits of having an IP PBX as opposed to a traditional PBX is the ability to have um, remote users. So you can have your headquarters 
let's say in this building, and then you have a, a branch office you know, down the road or in California or in London or wherever, and it's the ease of setting those, setting those systems up to talk to all of your employees throughout the country or throughout the region um, without too much in terms of configuration or additional equipment at each of those sites. One of the downsides um, from a BCDR perspective um, with an on-premise system is that system is in your office. So if your office goes dark, then everybody in your organization is also dark. So it's, it's great for consolidation, but at the same time there are some issues with having it in a location like an office that doesn't have primary, secondary, and tertiary power, or only has one internet connection, or maybe a cable modem, or maybe you know really crappy copper um, that you terminate your POTS lines or your PRIs to. So, Although there are VoIP benefits to it, there are also some limitations to an IP PBX. The same limitations that you would have with a, a traditional PBX. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is a hybrid type of solution. And a hybrid type of solution, in the way I see it, <coughs> is let's say you have a, a PBX. It, like, you've invested a lot of money in a PBX. You have you know, a couple hundred seats on it or a couple hundred extensions on it. And you're not looking to migrate to an IP PBX or a hosted platform because you have what you have and it's working great for you, but you still would like to take some benefit, um, VCDR benefits from, from VoIP. And one of those things that we, we see a lot of companies doing is leaving the PBX there and taking the dial tone and moving the dial tone to a VoIP service provider. Um, a VoIP service provider would, for example, uh, replace your PRI. Are you guys familiar with like the terminology I'm using some at all? Or okay, um, I just want to make sure I'm not. So you want to stop familiar with it? Don't be practice. <laughs> okay. So so dial tone comes into a phone system. It's a PRI. Uh, public rate interface. What it is is it's a T1 that comes into a phone system that gives you dial tone. Basically, it's like 23 lines of voice. When you get it from the phone company. Um, it, they, they bring in a T1 just like they would bring in a data T1. Plug it in, you plug it into your phone system, and you're off and running. You have uh, 100 telephone numbers, and you have 23 channels of inbound and outbound calling. That's great until the copper goes bad and that fails. And there's nothing you can do about it. There's no real failover plan from most, most PRI providers. You, know, you, can call, you can call Verizon and say, hey, I need an emergency call forward on my numbers. And they'll tell you, okay, it'll be done in 24 to 48 hours. It's expensive, too. By, by then, the problem is solved, and you didn't have any sort of redundancies with that PRI. Or not solved, you're still down 24 to 48 hours. Right, exactly. exactly. Excuse me. Um, so so in, a real, in a replacement scenario, by putting in an avoid PRI, you get some benefits. Number one, because we're delivering that, that those telephone lines over the internet, we can make it redundant by putting in two internet connections or using a primary internet connection for voice and then piggybacking off of a data connection. And so if the primary connection goes down, we still have a route in and out and nothing should change in your environment. Now let's say you lose power entirely to your facility and to your building um, or in, 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 your, in your organization. So you still need um, to be able to receive calls or put a message somewhere to say, hey, we're out of business right now, we're out of service right now, or you know, we'll do a call forwarding. You can do that in a VoIP scenario where you just log into a portal, let's say, um, prior to an actual incident happening and say, if the PRI fails or if this line card fails, automatically route to another location. Maybe you have another office or maybe you have cell phones or maybe you have a group of people that are in your business uh, uh, in your BCDR planning, say these people, these five people are going to be answering calls in an emergency. So you just log in, you say I'm going to route all these calls to the, you know, to the main number to these five people until the system comes back up. And that's all automated. You don't need to do that during the emergency. You set that up in an automated fashion. Um, so that, that, that's kind of, <clears throat> in the hybrid scenario, that, those are some of the options you have for, um, for BCDR planning. 